Welcome to Talking with Ted in our current series, which is Flora for Hikers. And today we are talking about some of our favorite plants, cacti. What is a cactus? Um, unfortunately, a number of people, including people who make really fine posters, are not sure what a cactus is. This is the program we had today on this same topic. Which of these plants are cacti? None but one. All right, so there is an obvious need for this information because it's confusing. Some people think if it's succulent, if it's picky, spiny, whatever, it's a cactus. And no, what is a cactus? All right. So, I'm going to rely on our friend, Clement Benson, talking about the cacti of Arizona to lay it out. All right. A cactus is a, um, maybe recognized, he says, by large, fleshy, usually leafless stems. All right. So, succulents, number one. And by spines. All right, that's consistent. Although there are some exceptions, plants, you know, some of them don't have spines actually, but almost all have spines. And here's the key part, developed in clusters within spirally arranged areoles, which are restricted areas on the stem. A cactus has areoles. Now, overall, the general, principle is that an organism is most reliably identified by how it reproduces. So it's got these areoles, but it also has consistent throughout the family flowers with many tepals. What is a tepal? A tepal is like a sepal and it's also like a petal and it's kind of like when they're all the same, you can't tell the difference and there's a bunch of them. Okay. So some people call that tepals. So, and it, the symmetry of this flower is radial. What's that? That means any way you slice that flower, you get an equal half. And so uh, it looks like a ball. You could cut a ball that way or a starfish that way and you get equal halves. So that's the symmetry of the flower. The fruit is usually fleshy. All right, and so that is a cactus. So we're gonna show you some pictures of plants and this is, uh, our initial quiz, is it a cactus, is it not? All right, so the one first is succulent, it's a stem, but the flowers are not right and it doesn't have areoles, all right? So, and it's got milky sap, all right, so that is a, a succulent from Africa it's not a cactus, even though it has spines on it. All right, next is a prickly pear. I do happen to have a pad of prickly pear. All right, we could play catch, but I don't think anybody wants to play catch with me because I'm throwing it and you're catching it. Ha! All right, so spines, areoles. There's a little spot there where they all come out of. Now, you'll notice on the prickly pears, as well as the choyas, all right, in this, these two groups, we have different kinds of spines, all right. Now, if you want to get specific below the genus level, the spines are gonna be important. What shape, what color, uh, radial spines, central spines, uh, do they have a sheath? Are they curved? Do they have bands? You know, etc. We'll see that in the pictures, all right? So, and they have a really cool thing called a glockid. We're gonna find out later how to eat a cactus and how to not eat a cactus, okay? All right, so that's a cactus. Aerials, very important spines, this little central area. Now, sometimes these pads, all right, they could be different shapes. Some of them have a lot of spines. Some of them don't have very many spines, but the areola is what's critical. Additionally, in the flower, many stamens, all right? Next, you have a single style. All right, let's say that the flower is down here, the pistil, and you have a style, all right, which is a, a 
top of that pistil, the female part of the fruit with the seeds. And at the top of the single style, you have stigmas that are divided, that stick out in different directions. Okay, that's consistent in the cactus family. Okay, so very technical book on the cacti of Arizona, Lyman Benson. Okay, good reference. Okay. We'll look at some more books here in a second. All right. Um, sometimes the fruits are spiny. Sometimes they are spineless. Sometimes the seeds are very tiny. You can just eat them up. Sometimes they're very hard and yucky. You cannot chew them. All right, so that varies within the family. 68 species of cacti in Arizona. So if you're looking at an agave, an ocotillo, and you go, no, 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 not a cactus, but you find a prickly pear, a barrel, a saguaro, uh, uh, organ pipe, all cactus, now you are have eliminated 3,900 and whatever species of plants to consider. There's only 68 in the state. You narrow it down to the family and whew, you're very close to accurate identification. Okay, so that's important, family level. All right, next. Um, there's a plant in the pictures that looks like an aloe vera. We talked about this in our oddballs. Okay, the panda family, there's a couple of pictures there. Fleshy leaves, not stems, okay? It's not a cactus. Um, the flowers on one of them are red, they're compact, nothing like an open flower of the cactus. Any plant, any organism, mammals, reptiles, birds, whatever, it's a combination of characters, and so you've gotta have that combination. Aerials, open flower, many parts, okay? Usually a fleshy fruit. That's a cactus with spines, okay? And there's an agave in that picture also, and that's not a cactus, why not? The fruit is a dry capsule, all right? It doesn't have aerials, all right? It's just it's got stiff, you know, spine tip leaves, that is not a cactus, okay? Combination of characters, consistent throughout the family. Now we're gonna look at some groups, thanks to our friend, I know we have a friend here. Friends write books. Okay, so Plants of Arizona. The way that Ann uh, Eppel here organizes them is by structure, tall, clumped, etc. And that's kind of how I'm gonna do it, all right, more or less. So we're gonna start with the columnar group. These cacti have very tall structures, way off the ground. Saguaros and organ pipe are the two that I'm gonna focus on. And the reason is they're pretty widespread, but especially they are critical to the food uh, history in this region for indigenous tribes. In fact, some base their calendar on the annual flowering of the saguaro. They had parties, they had mass gatherings because often these fruits uh, also develop when there wasn't a lot of other food around. And so it was critical social cohesion. It was all part of life in the desert. And how important is that for us to understand well how life in the desert happens? We want to live here sustainably. Okay. All right, so saguaros, state flower of Arizona, white flowers, uh, spineless fruits. Part of the distribution of saguaro is affected by uh, distribution of the seeds by doves, all right? Because they eat the fruits, spread the seeds around their feces, and that's how you get new plants. Saguaros typically start in a nurse plant under a ironwood, a palo verde, whatever. 200 years later, tree's gone, saguaro's standing there. Like, what's going on, okay? So, but it starts out better moisture, better soil, protection from people that, animals rather, that wanna eat it. Rabbits, rats, squirrels, javelina. Okay. The, I'll give you one little quick thing about organ pipe. Okay, they had a uh, process back in the day to get the most out of it. So they had a thing called second harvest. How to gather the seeds twice. They don't do this anymore. Look it up, it's kind of interesting. All right, 
That's the columnar ones. There are others, but they're not like the Sunita, which we'll look at later, but just, they're very restricted in their range. And so, you know saguaros, you know Oregon pipe, you know the ones that are the most widely distributed. In fact, we have Saguaro National Park, Oregon Pipe National Monument. So areas set aside recognizing the significance of these plants in this region. Okay, next group, the jointed cacti. All right, and so you have two uh, ones in this group, the ones with the flat pads, all right, prickly pears, and the ones in the more cylindrical. But again, you've got these jointed, all right? They have these segments. You take this segment, you stick it in the ground, you get a new plant, okay? Magic. Um, in the old days, maybe in the 40s, 50s, ranchers, Southern Arizona, you gotta get rid of this stuff because the cows don't like it, it inhibits the grass, taking the moisture. So they would take two tractors, put a chain between them and just drag it across the field and knock them all down essentially replanting them everywhere. Okay, ignorance is not bliss when it comes to plants because plants rule, animals drool, as we know. All right, so the first one I've got there is teddy bear choya. The fruits are useless, they're sterile seeds. And so this piece breaks off, falls in the ground, starts a new plant. Okay, you'll get whole hillsides covered with this stuff. It has these spines, again, like the glockids, where they've got these little recourse barbs. They're called a jumping choya because they, they seem like they jump on you. They don't, but it seems like it because they just get on you and you try to flick it off and it's on somebody else. So you can't walk through there without getting stuck. So we have your cone ready to flick it off of your person. Black trunk. Um, they're very cuddly. Cacti are very friendly. They like to stick to you. Gotta learn to appreciate it. All right. So next we have purple uh, prickly pear. Now purple prickly pear is arborescent. It's a tree. Now, if you look at another one of our friendly books, okay, Rocky Mountain Trees. Which state in the Rocky Mountain states has the most variety of trees? Arizona, broadleaf trees, conifers, doesn't matter. More than Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana, and Colorado, anywhere, okay. Five of those species are cacti, are considered trees. You gotta know what a tree is. All right, so we have the variety and cacti are included in this one purple prickly pear it has a single trunk and then it kind of grows out and it has a little bit of a canopy kind of thing. It's arborescent tree like, okay? Flat pads, not prominent spawns, mostly the little glock of things and the pads like its name says can get kind of purplish. Next, I've got Christmas choya in there. Little tiny stems, red fruits in December. All right, Christmas choya. Not like the one you would buy in the nurse or in the florist shop. That's a tropical thing, okay? Um, prominent spines, uh, not easy to deal with. Look at them, appreciate them from a distance. And then I've got the cane choya in there with the lumpy yellow fruits. The areoles are sometimes arranged in ribs, which we'll see in the barrels and then we saw in the saguaros and the uh, organ pipes, but sometimes they're just scattered all over the place, okay? So the fruit in the case of the cane choya is spineless. It is edible, I've eaten it a few times. Um, easy to pick because it doesn't have any spines on it. And you cut it up like a vegetable, throw it in your crock pot and you're good to go. Seeds you probably want to take out because again, like most choya seeds and the prickly pear seeds are pretty hard. You have to know how to eat them or get rid of them or grind them, but you're probably not going to do that. Lumpy, yellow when they're ripe. They pit baked them back in the day. All right, then I've got a picture of a prickly pear and you can see very easily there the prominent open flower pattern. Okay, prickly pear. Then I've got the fruits there, and you'll see all those little aerials, gotta have aerials on the fruit. Glockids all over the place. We're gonna find out how to eat one of those. And then I've got new pads and the immature fruits there, and you'll see at the top of um, the fruit is a little cup, all right? Things like the cup, and again, the spines, how prominent, the color, all those things help you know what species you're talking about. Okay, you can readily recognize a prickly pear or a choya, no big deal. But which prickly pear, which choya? Then you've got to look at those more specific details of minutia if you're interested. And then you can see the pads, new pads coming off of the prickly pear where 
You can just take that off and just eat it right there. Be careful of the glockids if they're on there. But they're tender and you can also easily cook them or singe off the spines. But that's how it just grows out of an aerial, new stems growing. Succulent stems. That's the cactus. Okay. Next, the group, small clumpy clusters, okay? Hedgehogs, uh, we've got a purple one there, a purple flowered one, the first desert uh, wildflowers, probably a prominent one is this prickly pear, or a hedgehog rather, excuse me. Uh, there's a beehive cactus, and some of these little ones, these little clump things, you never even notice them because they're growing underneath something else. And until they're in flower, you, you, you know, because they blend in, and they're going to then stand out with the flowers. Um, the mammillaria the, uh, has the aerials on the end of a bump, okay? It's like a nipple. Um, so that's the name of the genus, mammillaria. It's got milky sap, all right? The fruits are red, tiny, easy to pick. The hook, the spines are hooked like a fish hook, sometimes called fish hook cactus. They taste rather nice, crunchy, sweet, little tart, like strawberry, sometimes called strawberry cactus. And you can see the bright pink flowers, okay, sticking out near the top. And that's about probably the only time you'll see it. Oftentimes they're growing in rocks, cracks, where there's more moisture and protection. Now, some of them do stand out. In Grapevine Canyon, we've talked about the fire recovery there from Goodwin Fire. There's a group of hedgehogs there Claret cup hedgehogs, and you'll see the mound like this big around, big, big across, hundreds maybe of clumps. And if, when they're in flower, you look across that, it's like looking across a sea of red. Incredible. Okay, and then finally, I've got a, a rainbow cactus. Um, and that's where you have the bands of the spines kind of alternate in the colors, all right? So no central spines, it just has the radial spines, all right? The spines, what are they there for? For protection, shade. Sometimes they're considered to even concentrate the moisture that does fall, but it's dew or something very limited, and it directs it then to drip off at the bottom of the plant. And the roots are shallow, man. They suck up water, anything available, quickly. That's how you survive in the desert. Now, the barrel cacti, shaped like a barrel. And there's a lot of myths or legends, whatever, about chopping off the top, mushing it up inside, and then you got a pool of water, all right? Some say it's bitter, some say it's poisonous, some say it's, you know, great, like a fountain. Okay, take it with a grain of salt, okay? It's not gonna happen. You gotta get rid of all those spines, a lot of work. It's probably not worth it, because how does a cactus survive in the desert? Holds on to the water. And if you think you're just gonna come in here and scoop up the water and take it, no, it's very complex, carbohydrates hanging onto that water. You have to mash it, cook it, work to get it out. Maybe you spend more water working than you're getting out in benefit. So the barrels, feral cactus is the most common genus, sometimes called compass barrel because, and the ribs tend to twist. Yeah, I see, have a picture there with the barrel and then a saguaro next to each other. All right, distinctions, they're all about the same height. Neither have arms at the present time, but different fruit, fruits, different uh, uh, products also, like the ribs you're gonna get on a saguaro. There aren't any in a barrel cactus. So uh, the ribs in a saguaro are straight. Barrels tend to be a little twisted or spiraled. The spines are different, red in a barrel, hooked, straight and white, generally in the saguaros. The fruits are very different. Okay, so it's important to make the distinction. And because that barrel kind of twists, it's twisting in a consistent direction. We talked about this in our navigation series. It tilts toward the southwest, sometimes called a compass barrel, reliably, all right? Very intense heat actually inhibits growth and it kind of just gets nailed in that direction all the time because that's the most intense direction out there, okay? The fruits you can pick off there, a little spiny, uh, spicy, no spines on the barrel cactus fruits. You just reach in there and pull them off. Seeds are tiny, no problem. Just munch on them. Not particularly juicy, but I've eaten them fresh many times. That's why I'm spicy. Kidding. That's why I wear the cactus shirt. You see that? <clears throat> All right. Now, 
That's what you're gonna run into. And we're talking about just those that you're likely to run into on the trail because this is hiking in the Southwest. There are many others. I mentioned that columnar one, the Sunita, okay? It has big gray spines up at the top, looks like an old man. Okay, get the picture? Yeah. All right, otherwise it looks similar to a, uh, or an organ pipe. The other one there is a genus called Pereschia. Where does Pereschia grow? Brazil, Costa Rica, 80 foot tree, looks like an orange tree. So this is one of the few that has leaves, regular leaves, but it has aerials, has the spines, has the same kind of fruit, same kind of flower. All right, it's a cactus family plant. You look at it, you go, that ain't no cactus. It is a cactus because it has aerials, radially symmetric flowers, many parts, fleshy fruits. Okay, aerial, critical cactus. All right. Some of those cacti down there in the tropics, they're epiphytes. They never even grow in the ground. They're up there where the orchids and the bromeliads are, okay? Because there's so much moisture. Some of them are miniatures. There's cacti that you get in little, you know, specialty, they're like this big, okay? So all kinds of different uh, plants out there. Cacti grow in the most barren places up to the timberline in the Andes. Uh, you know, wet places, dry places, cold places, hot places. It's just important that they're dry places. All right, now we're gonna take another test. And then we're gonna find out how to eat a cactus. All right, so I got pictures there. I went down to the Bear Jackson car show and they had some artwork there. And I got a couple pictures of all these amazing plants like saguaros and barrels and prickly pear and agave. Okay, are there any of them that are cacti? It's a trick question. No, because they're all fake. They're just metal. It's not a cactus. It's not a plant. It looks like one. It's a trick. Sorry. All right. Then I've got a prickly pear. Okay. You see the purple fruit, fleshy, aerials. Okay. Cactus. The flower. I've got a hedgehog. Purple, open, radially symmetric, many parts, stigma, divided, green up at the top, many stamens. Cactus. And then, of course, our friend the prickly pear with the new pads coming off of there. That's the best time to pick them to eat them. All right. Now we come to the question, how do you eat a cactus? We're going to demonstrate how to do this. We're going to demonstrate how not to do this. I've got several other books here I'm going to mention first. And don't forget, at the very end of the day, I've got a picture in there of somebody hugging a cactus. Check it out. really works. They're friendly. Okay. All right, how do you eat a cactus? Let's ask our friend, Samuel Thayer. Okay, edible plants. I mean, this guy is like all over the country, but most of the plants don't grow here, but he does have this thing on prickly pears. I gotta just read this very briefly. Prickly pear, no fog. I knew you could eat prickly pear pads because I had seen them in grocery stores and even once bought one. I had also read about wild prickly pears and a number of edible plant guides. I had done my book research. It was time to begin the field work. I gingerly seized a succulent looking pad and twisted it free. All the spines were on the top, so I took a big turtle sized bite out of the bottom side and chewed it up as I walked back toward the fence. Tasted just fine, but as I swallowed, I noticed a strange, uncomfortable feeling. No, it definitely qualified as pain in my throat, my tongue, my cheeks, the roof of my mouth. I had never heard of a glockid until then. Uh, and if you've heard of them, I know a lot about them now from experience. Glockids are horrible. Okay, they'll get in you and you don't even know it. Then you're just gonna feel this thing sticking you or a bunch. Do not eat a cactus that way. But our friend Wendy Hodgson is gonna tell us that we should. So we gotta figure out how to do this. Okay. Food plants of the Sonoran Desert. Saguaros were very important to the Indians. Candelaria Orozco emphasized the importance of saguaros and other native foods in their once healthier diet. Years ago, we worked hard to preserve our food. We gathered choya, buds, saguaro, cactus, fruit. This is why we live 
longer lives. The old people are strong. Now the young people get old fast because they eat soft food. Miguel Velasco echoed this sentiment. We drank the desert fruit juices in harvest time. The desert food is meant for the Indians to eat. The reason so many die young is because they don't eat their desert food. Eat it. How do you eat it? Okay. Um, Delana Toll's got a few recipes in here. All right. And we've got some, uh, you got to know what you're eating first, right? And so I do have some technical guides of Cactaceae by Britton and Rose. Very technical, man, this stuff's gnarly. But if you really want to get into it, these are the reference sources to know all about cacti. This book, the Illustrated Cyclopedia of Succulents, a guide to the natural history and cultivation of cacti and cactus-like plants. All right, this is really helpful about growing them. And the, we've talked about this book before, the overview, plant family, the world, all right? So B.H. Haywood is the editor, and it gives you a very nice um, overview of cacti, where they grow, what they look like, all the varieties, okay, and uses, how important they are economically, okay? Now, some of these books, like this one, okay, it's got a few cacti in it, but it, it suffers from the same problem that most plant ID guides uh, do, all right? So they have a variety of pictures, and you're supposed to simply match the picture with your plant. What if it's not in flower? And the only flowers that they have are the red cacti, those claret cup. But the other cacti they have in here, about 10, 20, well, 10 species, yellow flowers, purple flowers, green flowers, okay. You, but once you know it's a cactus, maybe that's, they figure that's close enough and you can just go to the cactus group. But there's more to it than simply the color, all right? And as we've talked about those attributes. All right, how are you gonna eat it? I've talked about this before as well, an edible plant meal. All right, Vitamix. You want a Vitamix built to last, okay? Go beyond blending, okay? Vitamix. This is not a $30 blender, it's like a $300 blender, okay? I used to take the fruits with a knife over a single burner, one at a time. Burn off the spines, peel it, take the seeds out, and you're throwing away most of the plant, the food, okay? So the Vitamix, you throw it all in there. Spines, uh, seeds, everything. What used to take hours now takes minutes. And so we've got a picture up there of the frozen bags, gallon bags of the fruit, all right? Then the other fruit, and I use our friend Betty Crocker with her apple crisp kind of recipe. And so I put the other fruit in the bottom of the platter. Where's the platter? Oh, it's right here. Okay. And... Then, once the fruit is in there, blackberries, uh, barberries, um, figs, peaches, other things that I grow, that's all on the bottom. I take the gallon of, of the prickly pear puree that's been thawed out because it's in a freezer, so I thaw it out, pour it in there so it's all in, it mixed in there. Then I've got my oats. I use stevia instead of brown sugar. Uh, nuts, because when you grind up those seeds and they're so fine, it's a little gritty. And when you put nuts across the top, I, when I have when my almond crop is good, then I use those almonds. But otherwise, the walnuts or um, pecans. Sprinkle, you know, crunch it all up, sprinkle across there, bake it in the oven, 375 for an hour and 15 minutes. Voila. Okay. For those that are a little skittish, you can put a little whipped cream or ice cream in it because it's kind of a dessert thing. It's a crisp. Um, Sweet. Otherwise, it's a little tart, but it's very like Wendy's, uh, the people that she quoted, live longer, keep cactus. Okay? All right. That's going to do it for our Cacti of Arizona. All right? Ornamental, uh, interesting, unusual, useful. You can't beat that. And when you're out there, we have more cacti than any other state except Texas. This is the place to find out about them. See you next time.